Thank you so much, uh, the meeting organizers, for this opportunity. Uh, like I've been introduced, I'm Dr. Sauda Namuviro Chizito. I'm a clinical microbiologist working with the Department of National Health Laboratory and Diagnostic Services Department, Ministry of Health, Uganda. And I'm here to share with you the cholera in Uganda, the molecular diagnosis journey. Uh, next slide. This? Yes. Oh, uh, so the outline, we shall talk briefly about the history of cholera in, in Uganda, the cholera diagnosis journey, microbiology culture, which remains the gold standard, the rapid immunological assays, molecular techniques, lessons learned and recommendations. Uh, so we've had uh, outbreaks in Uganda with sporadic cases and localized outbreaks occurring, resulting in prolonged uh, widespread epidemics. Outbreaks have occurred periodically in every region of Uganda since 1971, and it is endemic in areas that are near rivers or lakes, that is in the Western Rift Valley, especially Lake Albert, Edward, Katwe, and George, and this really borders uh, the DRC. Other affected communities include uh, those ones that are bordering countries, uh, that is DRC, South Sudan, and Kenya, due to the influx of refugees or due to the conflicts. So the journey has uh, been a very long one. We started with clinical diagnosis in the 1960s. This was coupled with uh, microscopy. And then we started culture in 1968. This was in preparation for there was an outbreak in the neighboring country, so we're preparing and indeed the preparation yielded because then the first outbreak occurred in 1971. Uh, we moved on to the conventional PCR, which has been in place since 2000. And then we got RDTs right about the same time. Then in 2018, we, got, uh, we started using the lamp assays and the future lies in cholera genomics, we believe. So the microbiology culture still remains the gold standard. Uh, the turnaround time is really three to four days from plating onto the selective agars to sequential subculture and then uh, detecting the toxin. So when we are doing the culture, we follow the standard, which is uh, the TCBS, which is the selective agar. Then we go to the non-selective agar. And then, of course, we do the oxidase and agglutination for detecting the particular serotype. Then we go ahead and do the AST. We, when we are doing the AST, we still follow the uh, GTFCC recommended antibiotics and, of course, the CLSI. So we have a couple of antibiotics, but not to uh, mention all. We do azithromycin, cipro, and tetracycline, amongst others. So this, this can be done in about nine public health laboratories in Uganda and a few private laboratories. However, we have regions uh, that do not have the capacity because these laboratories are located in regional referral hospitals, but we have 16 regional referral hospitals. So as you can see the mathematics, nine is barely a half of the 16. So those laboratories that cannot uh, do the testing on site, refer their samples to the National Microbiology reference laboratory for testing. And this uh, picture is showing the robust National Microbiology Reference Laboratory, which has, supports the other sites. So this is a picture showing the nine antimicrobial resistance sentinel sites, uh, also the sites that have capacity for microbiology testing. So as you can see, we have nine of them. The bigger the dot is the bigger the capacity of the samples, hence the isolates that they refer to the reference laboratory. So as you can see, they are skewed towards the side that also has, the, has been affected by cholera uh, a lot. But we, you realize that the last outbreak that we had, that was in 2000, uh, 2020, was in Moroto. And it is one of the sites that does not have the capacity to do the actual on-site testing. So that is still a challenge. Uh, however, to mitigate this challenge of some laboratories not having the capacity, we have a robust sample transport network, which has about 100 hubs. Hubs are the sites where we either collect or do the, the testing for some of the pathogens. 
And these ones connect to over 3,000 facilities, and we call these the spokes. And we have about 300 motorbikes. These transport the samples from the smallest health facility to the hubs. And we have about 16 uh, hubs uh, vehicles that move from the hubs to the reference laboratories. This was initially for uh, HIV, but it has been used for even other diseases, including bacteriology. So you have the health center 24, and then we go to the hub. Then we use the poster system, and then we go to the central public health laboratories, which is now the reference laboratory. And this is how the hubs are distributed. Uh, it, they still need for more hubs, but at least we are comfortable that we can really get, we can reach every person during an outbreak or even routine uh, using this system. Uh, when we move to the rapid diagnostics, mainly they are for screening because they are not yet fully rolled out. Uh, previously, there was one that was targeting the O1 and, and the O139 and their, their cholera toxin. But the one currently in use, though under validation, targets the O1 and its toxin. The beauty with this is they can be done at point, uh, point of care and all samples are still referred to the microbiology reference laboratory irrespective of the RDT result and irrespective of what result has been got at the uh, testing laboratory. We had an experience with this uh, last year, we had a scare of uh, cholera, a scare because it was eventually not cholera, where we rushed, it was in one of the uh, islands that borders Kenya, no Tanzania, the Luwe Island, very remote, and notably they don't allow women on that island. But we were able to get the team to reach that island very fast with our uh, RDTs. They did the RDT on site, but they still took off samples that were taken to the reference laboratory. We have had the conventional PCR since 2000, and it is largely in study mode, but it still serves a public health function. Currently used on demand, and it is stationed at the National Health Laboratory and Diagnostic Services Department, but we also have uh, capacity at re research laboratories to do this. Uh, we use the gel electrophoresis method, and the uh, turnaround time is about three to four hours. Then we have the lamp. Uh, as you can see, this is a property of the John Hopkins University, so it is uh, really something that we are embracing. It is new. But it has advantages because it has faster and requires a shorter turnaround time. It's easier to use and it can be deployed in the field as you can see, it is very portable. It's still in research mode and it's still being validated. So we still need, uh, I think the Gavi uh, opportunity comes in right uh, here handy. Uh, so what lessons have we learned? Molecular techniques are still very expensive in terms of supplies, equipment, and technical competences, that is the training. The culture turnaround time is still long, especially in cases of outbreaks, although it is the gold standard and we acknowledge that. Immunological assays like RDTs are promising, but the one that is currently uh, being used is yet to be validated. Dedicated funding to molecular diagnostics and surveillance can improve national capacity for detection and preparedness. So in conclusion, Uganda has made great strides in cholera diagnostics from clinical diagnosis in the 1960s to molecular techniques. Culture still remains the gold standard in the country. RDTs provide an even more acceptable and cheaper point of care if validated in the Ugandan context. Molecular techniques, especially the lamp, are promising assays that need to be validated and rolled out for routine testing. The country has genomic capacity for other uh, infections and cholera is yet to be included on this. So of course, to look at the, the, to look at the, rule, uh, the source and also to look at the resistance. And so that is the current state of the genomics laboratory. It's still small, but we are proud of the steps made. Thank you.